It was on the banks of the Don River in southern Russia that the shattered bones of an Ice Age man first emerged from the loam. Discovered in 1954 at a site known as Kostenki 14, the remains of this young man, olive-skinned and short-statured, would remain enigmatic for decades. Only in recent years has his DNA revealed a startling truth. This 36,000-year-old hunter-gatherer was already what we would call European. Kostenki 14's high-coverage genome revealed that he basically contains all the genetic components that you find in contemporary Europeans at 37,000 years ago, according to evolutionary biologist S.K. Willislev. This statement directly challenged the once-dominant model that Europeans derived their ancestry from three separate waves of migration, each occurring in the last 10,000 years. Instead, Kostenki 14's genome suggested that Europe was already home to a pure European race far earlier than expected. The man's DNA carried elements from three ancestral groups, European hunter-gatherers, Middle Easterners, who later became Europe's early farmers, and a mysterious group of Northwest Asians linked to the Great Steppe. Remarkably, Kostenki, 14, carried all three genetic signatures long before the supposed arrival of each component. As Willislev explained, in principle, you just have sex with your neighbor and they have it with their next neighbor. You don't need to have these armies of people moving around to spread the genes. This finding reframes the history of human migration in Eurasia. After modern humans left Africa some 60,000 years ago, they interbred with Neanderthals in the Middle East, according to the dominant narrative. One group moved toward Asia and Oceania, while another, Kostenki 14's ancestors, pushed north into the cold expanses of Ice Age Europe. Over time, these people intermingled in what Villaslev calls a large meta-population that probably stretched all the way from the Middle East into Europe and into Eurasia. This interconnected superpopulation formed the rootstock of what would become modern Europeans. There was no single migration or sudden genetic replacement, just gradual mixing, reinforced by a shared ancestry that persisted through climatic upheavals. His Y chromosome, curiously, matches that of a 7,000-year-old hunter-gatherer from Spain, providing some level of continuity in European populations across almost 30,000 years, as Harvard geneticist Iosif Lazaridis notes. This challenges the notion that Europe's genetic identity is the result of recent upheaval. Instead, it seems, the seeds of modern European identity were planted tens of millennia ago and persisted, even as glaciers advanced and cultures rose and fell. Part 2. Neanderthal Genes, Hand Bones and the Mystery of Robusticity Beyond his skull and genome, the man from Kostenki offers another lesson, one written in the bones of his hands. The phalanges of his fingers are exceptionally thick-walled, a feature known as medullary stenosis, where the internal marrow cavity shrinks under the pressure of dense cortical bone. This is not a typical Homo sapiens trait. It echoes the anatomy of a very different kind of human, the Neanderthals. But Kostenki 14 wasn't a Neanderthal, as the study relates he was Cro-Magnon and pure European, although he did have some Neanderthal ancestry, especially on chromosome 6. So where did these bones, these hyper-robust fingers, come from? In 2017, Dr. Mednikova published a study examining the finger bones of early Homo sapiens and Denisovans. Her analysis of Denisova III's distal phalanx, the last bone in the pinky, revealed a structure so thick it couldn't have belonged to a Neanderthal. This bone was so powerful in structure that Mednikova suggested its traits may derive from tropical modern humans through an ancient introgression event. In other words, some of these robust traits might not be purely Neanderthal. They may represent a shared legacy from early tropical Homo sapiens, who used their hands intensively for climbing, tool use, and manipulating forest materials. In forested environments, biomechanical stress can promote robusticity. In places like Siberia, adaptation to cold and harsh use of the hands, combined with genetic inheritance, could compound this effect. Kostenki 14's hand bones, along with those of the Altai Neanderthals, suggests that the overlap may not be coincidental. According to Mednikova, the exceptionally robust phalanges of the Altai Neanderthals might have derived from early tropical Homo sapiens, their ancestors by way of ancient gene flow. 
In this view, the boundaries between Neanderthal and Cro-Magnon are not only genetic, they're visible in the bones themselves. Crucially, Kostenki 14's genome shows evidence of this mixture. His Neanderthal DNA percentage is about 1% higher than that of modern Europeans or Asians. But more striking is the length of the Neanderthal segments. In his genome, these sections remain intact and unbroken, one stretching more than three million base pairs. Such long sequences would have been chopped apart by recombination over generations if they had been inherited many thousands of years earlier. By estimating the decay of these sequences, scientists calculated that Kostenki 14's ancestors interbred with Neanderthals about 54,000 years ago. That timeline fits perfectly with the picture emerging from other ancient genomes, such as the Ust Ishim man of Siberia. The long, pristine stretches of Neanderthal DNA in both individuals confirm a shared and early hybridization event, perhaps a single encounter in the Middle East that seeded Neanderthal genes across Eurasia. But the hand bones tell us something more. Unlike later Europeans, Kostenki 14 and some contemporaries bore the robust traits not just of their Neanderthal heritage, but perhaps of an earlier biomechanical tradition inherited from forest-dwelling tropical ancestors. Part 3. Sungir, the splendor and kinship of the ancient Russian dead. 500 kilometers or 300 miles north of Kostenki, along the banks of the Klyazma River, beneath layers of loam and forest soil, a Paleolithic graveyard lay sleeping for more than 30,000 years. It was only in the middle 20th century that Soviet archaeologists uncovered what would become one of the most extraordinary Ice Age burial sites in the world. Known as Sungir, this upper Paleolithic site sits just 200 kilometers east of Moscow, near the ancient city of Vladimir. It stands as one of the earliest and most opulent testaments to the lives and the deaths of modern Homo sapiens in Eurasia. Radiocarbon dating has placed Sungir between 32,000 and 50 and 28,550 years ago, with pollen evidence suggesting the people buried here lived during a relatively warm phase of the Ice Age known as Greenland Interstadial 5, around 30,500 to 30,000 years ago. Their world was one of cold winds and mammoths, but also of astonishing ritual and symbolic depth. The Sungir burials shocked archaeologists with their richness, Two children, laid head to head, were dressed in thousands of ivory beads, with spears carved from mammoth tusks laid beside them. An adult male was buried nearby, draped in similar ornamentation. These were not ordinary graves. These were statements of identity, status, perhaps even of grief and faith. They told the world, across the abyss of millennia, that humans in the Ice Age felt deeply, and remembered their dead with reverence. Yet beyond the grave goods and ceremonial splendor, it is the genetic legacy of the Sungir individuals that binds them irrevocably to the great Eurasian story. Modern genomic analysis has confirmed what their physical location suggested. The Sungir people were close genetic kin to the early humans of Kostenki. But not just any Kostenki lineage. They showed a particularly close affinity to Kostenki 12 rather than Kostenki 14. The genetic resemblance went both ways. Kostenki 12 was closer to the Sungir individuals than it was to Kostenki 14, suggesting a sister lineage relationship that had likely branched off before or around the time of the last glacial maximum. This paints a picture of deep ancestral structure in the upper Paleolithic population of Eastern Europe. While Kostenki 14 stood slightly apart, perhaps representing an older or more isolated strand, the Songir and Kostenki 12 individuals seem to have belonged to a thriving and interconnected lineage whose members moved across the great river basins of Russia, exchanging genes, culture, and perhaps even stories. In turn, the Sunga genomes also displayed strong links to the Vestonice cluster, a group of Gravetian-era individuals found at Dolny Vestonita in what is today the Czech Republic. These sites were part of the vast Gravetian cultural network that spanned Ice Age Europe, known for its art, burials, and advanced hunting strategies. The people of Sungir were thus part of a pan-European web of human migration and cultural transmission, long before the word Europe existed. 
On the paternal side, the Sungear males all belong to Y chromosome haplogroup C1A2, a subclade of haplogroup C1, which was once widespread in Upper Paleolithic Europe, but is now vanishingly rare in modern Europeans. It echoes the Kostenki man's own haplogroup, C1b, two different but related branches of the same ancient paternal lineage. This hints at a genetic continuity in Ice Age Europe, suggesting that C1 lineages may once have been dominant, later pushed aside by the influx of Neolithic farmers and Bronze Age herders. The maternal side was equally telling. The Sungir one male carried mitochondrial DNA haplogroup U8C, while the other individuals, Sungir 2, 3 and 4, belonged to a subclade of U2, the same maternal lineage observed in Kostenki remains. These ancient U clades, especially U2 and U8, recur again and again in Ice Age burials from Russia to France, forming the matrilineal backbone of Upper Paleolithic Europe. Together, these paternal and maternal markers reinforce a striking fact that the Sungir people, for all their elaborate burial rites and rich cultural expression, were biologically part of the same human tapestry as the Kostenki cluster. They were regional variations within a continental population, shaped by local drift and microevolution, but still bound by shared ancestry stretching back to the original expansion of Homo sapiens into Europe. The connection between Kostenki and Sungir is more than genetic. It is geographic, cultural and ancestral. These sites, scattered across the vast plain of southern Russia, were once part of a living network of Homo sapiens adapting to the Ice Age world. They hunted reindeer, carved ivory, buried their dead in ritual, and raised children with love and sorrow. Their bloodlines split and rejoined, diverged and reformed, shaping what we now recognize as the earliest European peoples. In the genome of Kostenki 14 and the splendor of the Sungir burials, we see the dawn of European identity. These were not isolated hunter-gatherers scratching out an existence on the steppe. They were members of a resilient, intelligent and deeply interconnected human world, a world whose legacy endures in our bones and blood even now. And so, across the span of 36,000 years, from Kostenki to Sungir, the story of Europe was already unfolding, not as a tale of invasions, but of kinship. Part 4. Africans, Cro-Magnons and Australian Aboriginals Before ancient genomes could speak for themselves, anthropologists listened to bones. For decades, physical anthropologist William Howells gathered measurements from thousands of human skulls, trying to trace humanity's journey through cranial morphology. In the late 1980s, he noticed a puzzling pattern. Many Ice Age European skulls, so-called Cro-Magnons, clustered not with modern Europeans, but with Aboriginal Australians and Papua New Guineans. This unexpected resemblance prompted a question that lingers today. Are the first Europeans, Africans and first Australians more closely related than we assumed? The Hofmeyer skull, discovered in South Africa's Eastern Cape, and dated to about 36,000 years ago, exactly the same age as Kostenki 14, offered a fresh chance to probe that connection. When compared with modern and fossil skulls from Africa, Europe and Eurasia, Hofmeyer did something strange. Instead of resembling sub-Saharan African populations like the Bushman or Kosan, the Hofmeyer skull is quite distinct from recent sub-Saharan Africans and has a very close affinity with the European Upper Paleolithic specimens. What did this mean? Did it suggest that early Homo sapiens moved not just north into Eurasia, but south into places like southern Africa, perhaps even moving back, or that both Hofmeyer and Kostenki represent a widespread early Eurasian phenotype that was not yet split into the regional morphologies we see today? Even more confounding was that Howells's original multivariate analysis placed the Kostenki skull, based on cranial shape, statistically very closely to the first Australians. This alignment might suggest a shared morphology, dating back to the original out-of-Africa dispersal. However, genomic analysis offers a powerful counterpoint. The DNA of Kostenki 14 made it clear. While his skull may resemble those of ancient Australians, genetically Kostenki was already pure European, as Villaslev observed. So how can two skulls, Kostenki and Hofmeyer, dated to the same period, 
one in Russia and one in South Africa, show such closeness? The answer may lie in the plasticity of skull shape and its susceptibility to environmental, dietary and even cultural factors like chewing and tool use. As paleoanthropology has matured, it has moved cautiously away from cranial comparisons as a primary indicator of ancestry. Still, these similarities are intriguing. They hint at a time before human populations had been firmly regionalized, when humans still bore the physical imprints of their shared origins. Kostenki 14 is more than a fossil. He is a message from a forgotten world, a genetic time capsule from a Europe that was not yet Europe. He walked the earth when mammoths roamed the plains, when the glaciers crept forward, when cultures rose and vanished in the blink of an epoch. And yet, in his DNA, he carried the future. His genome already has the three major European components present that we detect in modern Europeans, as Johannes Krauss put it. His skull whispered of kinship with far-off Australians and Africans. His fingers bore the burden of ancient labour and ancient ancestry. And in the spirals of his DNA, Neanderthal blood flowed, fresh and long and intact. He was not an outlier. He was a foundation. He was not the end of something primitive, but the beginning of something enduring. Kostenki fourteen was, in Villaslev's words, already pure European. And he still is.